Good, good, cool. Great, yep. okay. Good to go. Um, so yeah, uh, welcome everyone who, who's watching this live and welcome to those who are watching it later on YouTube. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful um, day outside. Uh, it's really amazing the difference that daylight savings makes. Eh? As I remember, what, a few months ago when we were meeting in person, it would be dark nights around this time. So it's uh, pretty amazing. But yeah, today I'll start us off by going through some astronomy news, look at what's been happening in the sky above us. Uh, yeah, and then we'll move on to our main presentation. So what's been happening above us? Now the big space news this week is debris from a Russian anti-satellite test could threaten astronauts and satellites for decades, says the US. So all this started uh, Monday this week when Russia destroyed a defunct Soviet era satellite called Cosmos 1408. So this satellite hasn't been used since the 1980s. It's just kind of uh, space debris basically. And Russia decided to do an anti-satellite missile test on it, but they didn't give anyone a heads up. They didn't uh, warn the US about it. So when it happened, it caused quite a flurry of um, a panic and excitement. And uh, it's estimated that, um, that by blowing this up, it generated around uh, 1,500 pieces of trackable orbital debris, as well as hundreds of thousands of smaller pieces that are too small for us to track. And uh, it caused quite a bit of panic at the International Space Station. There are currently seven astronauts on board, and uh, they were forced to take refuge in transport vehicles because during periods of time when the ISS enters parts of space where there is debris, NASA gives them a heads up and says, you know, hey, uh, there might be some debris around just to be on the safe side. Why don't you kind of get in the uh, lifeboats as it were, get into the capsules just in case something goes wrong in the ISS and you have to leave in a hurry. Um, so, so fortunately, none of the debris hit the ISS, but as they kept uh, orbiting, every 90 minutes they would pass through this field again. So it was uh, quite frustrating for the astronauts having to, you know, sort of get into the lifeboats, as it were, and then get out again, 90 minutes later, go in again. Uh, and uh, of course, at the moment, there's also the Chinese Tianhe space station. Um, it's unclear whether that was affected. We haven't heard any reports from them. Uh, but um, I mean, it's quite likely that this could have caused some concern from them as well. So all in all, several levels of the US government have condemned this. And uh, it's yeah, basically kind of surprised that Russia, uh, first of all, did this at all, but also did it without a warning uh, NASA or you know, giving anyone a heads up of, of any kind. So how much of a problem is space debris? And how much space debris is there? Well, according to the ESA Space Debris Office, there are around 36,500 pieces of space debris out there that are larger than 10 centimeters. So this could be you know, anything from old panels and bits of rockets, like the really big, you know, chunky things. Uh, but there's also estimated to be around a million pieces that are one centimeter to 10 centimeters. And it's estimated 330 million pieces that are one millimeter to one centimeter. So there's quite a lot of things kind of flying around the earth at the moment. And you might be thinking, okay, those big ones sound dangerous, but the small ones, you know, it's probably fine, right? But the thing is the International Space Station travels at 7.66 kilometers per second. And so due to that, that high speed, even a marble sized object could penetrate a pressurized module. So even something tiny as that could cause a disaster. Uh, which is why earlier this week, uh, the astronauts in there kind of went into the lifeboats just in case something went wrong. But also in the news, the interstellar Oumuamua may not be a nitrogen iceberg after all. So you may recall that uh, this first hit the news a few years ago, October 2017, and this interstellar object was discovered that we still don't fully understand what it is. So it was named Oumuamua. And the reason we're pretty sure that it's interstellar in origin is based on its speed and its path. It's thought that it was traveling too fast to have originated in our solar system. So it's thought it kind of entered our solar system and then left again. 
And yes, since then, there's been a lot of theories about what it is. Uh, a lot of people think maybe it's aliens. Uh, but earlier this year, um, there was a study in March that concluded it's most likely a chunk of nitrogen ice. And uh, one of the reasons they came up with this theory is that they looked at Pluto and the nitrogen ice that we see on there. And um, the idea is that Oumuamua uh, kind of gave off some of the same signatures. So the theory is, well, maybe there are a lot of other Pluto-like planets out there. And maybe over time, enough stuff has been kind of chipped off them that it's, it's formed this kind of giant chunk of nitrogen ice. Uh, but now a Harvard astrophysicist um, disputes that. And he says there's not enough nitrogen ice in the, the whole universe to make an object that big. So a is 600 meters long, 100 meters wide. And basically he refutes this theory by saying, well, if we're relying on there being enough Pluto-like planets out there, then based on what we know about how common those planets should be, and even if all of the nitrogen surface ice was somehow chipped off them and, and made this, it still wouldn't make something this big. It wouldn't account for that. So yeah, still a bit of an unanswered question about Oumuamua. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it might be a long time before we find out uh, what it really is or was, if we find out at all. Also in the news, uh, a quasi-satellite may be a lost fragment of the moon. So this is about a 40 meter wide near Earth asteroid called Kamo Oelewa, which was discovered way back in uh, 2016. And this particular object it orbits the sun in an orbit that's very similar to Earth's. Uh, and it's very quite, it's uh, close to Earth as well. And based on the orbital analysis, it's thought that it's, it's probably been here for over 100 years. Uh, but one of the things about this is we've been unsure exactly what it was made of. So a, a recent study looked at this with an infrared telescope and found that the light spectra is similar to lunar rock samples that were brought back to Earth in the Apollo mission. So now the latest thinking is that maybe this is part of the moon. Because we know, obviously, there's a lot of craters on the moon. Um, maybe when you know, some of these rocks from the moon get chipped off and go into space, uh, this, this was one of them that kind of got caught in an orbit around the sun. Uh, but hopefully we'll know more because China is planning a mission in 2024 to go to Kamo Oela and actually collect a sample and bring it back to Earth so we can uh, look at it in more detail. And a star system with right angled planets has been discovered, which surprises astronomers. Now this star system was first discovered in uh, 2016. It's called HD 3167. And they found that there were three planets in this star system. And by watching it, they saw that uh, two of these planets had a polar orbit. So what that means is, you know, usually like in, in our solar system, we've got the sun, all the planets revolve around in a, a plane around the sun. And that's, uh, that's the same for a lot of stars out there. But we have found stars before where planets orbit around the poles, kind of like top ways rather than around. So it's not that unusual. But uh, what is unusual is that now we've found that the third planet in the system actually orbits in the star's uh, flat plane. So we have one planet kind of going around like this and then two going around uh, the poles. And this is the first known star system where this occurs. So I guess it just goes to show even with all that we know about space and astronomy, we're still finding new and unusual things that can surprise us and learning more about the strange star systems that are out there. And finally in the news, don't miss tomorrow night's partial lunar eclipse. So it starts at 8 p.m. and uh, peaks at 10 p.m. And uh, it's visible um, here, in, uh, uh, here in Auckland. I think, the, I think it ends around 1 a.m. And don't forget that uh, the Hibiscus Coast Astronomical Society is running a lunar eclipse photography and art art competition. So um, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be in astrophotography. Even if you just use your phone's camera, go out and try to uh, snap a photo. 
And if you don't like photos, that's fine. You can do a, a sketch, a painting, whatever, just some sort of artwork about the eclipse. And to enter, all you need to do is email your photos or artwork to hibiscuscoastastronomy at gmail.com, or you can post it on our Facebook group using the hashtag HCAS uh, Lunar Contest. Entries close Monday at 6 p.m. So you've got the weekend, so tomorrow night and the weekend and Monday. So yeah, uh, give it a go. And prizes will be given out at our next in-person meeting. Hopefully it won't be that much longer before we can meet in person. But yeah, there's, uh, there's um, I understand there's a book, there's some, some chocolates. So um, yeah, if, if you're interested to enter, just send us an email or uh, post something on the group. And yeah, that's the astronomy news for today. So I'll pass us back to James. Over to you, James. Thanks, Josh. Yes, uh, remember the, the contest is open to anyone. Uh, so it doesn't matter. You, you don't even have to be a member. Um, you know, you can uh, just join and uh, it's all, all in good fun. Okay. Um, we're going to be handing over to our special guest uh, for this evening. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, Simon Lewis, who is coming to us uh, courtesy of Canterbury Astronomical Society. Uh, it's our very first uh, uh, South Island club uh, to, to help us out with the talk. Um, so Simon is the um, vice president of uh, CAS. And uh, like me, he is a uh, ham radio operator and uh, got into uh, amateur radio astronomy as well. So uh, very interesting uh, that uh, we're quite similar there. Um, so yeah, over to you, Simon. Thanks, James. And um, yeah, I'm kind of a reformed ham radio operator. I haven't really touched it in quite a number of years. I, uh, I'm focusing mostly on uh, on astrophotography these days. And um, the first thing I'll say is uh, this isn't uh, this isn't about a talk about uh, ham radio. This is a talk about uh, radio astronomy, but amateur amateur astronomy. Um, what you're going to see here tonight is is um, projects and science that you can do uh, at home with uh, very simple equipment, very low cost equipment. Um, nothing that we're going to look at tonight here will cost more than a couple hundred dollars and, and significantly less if you are um, uh, good at um, hunting parts out or um, you can um, wield a soldering iron and some tools, then you could do this uh, for, uh, for a lot less. So a bit about me, yeah. As James said, I'm the vice president of the Canterbury Astronomical Society. I've been involved with CAS for um, quite a number of years. Um, the vice president's role is one that doesn't really have um, any um, uh, role, you know, internal responsibilities in terms of um, like, you know, like an editor's role. But one of the things that I do do is um, I'm kind of a lead around our, um, membership and growth program for the um, society. Um, over the last nine months to 12 months or so, we've doubled our uh, membership. Um, so we're uh, over um, 260 members now uh, in our society. Um, we run a number of uh, programs for juniors. So we run a, a junior program called the Castronauts, and um, that's a lot of uh, uh, you know STEM research for those guys. They get all sorts of training at the observatory. We do training nights for them and get them on the telescopes, uh, and they usually bring along mum and dad as well, so they get dragged into it, which is which is good. And um, we also do um, a ton of outreach. So every Friday evening, the observatory is open um, and good weather like you can see behind me here. You can, um, you know, we can fill the observatory with about 90 people every Friday evening if we get, um, get the um, get the conditions for it. And we also do uh, a, a 15 night program in July, which is part of what is called Kids Fest, which is part of a Christchurch City Council uh, activity. And then we do our own um, private groups as well. 
And then in between, if we've got any spare time or any inclination to do any other astronomy in the winter after doing Friday nights, Saturday nights, and, um, you know, 15 nights in July, then um, the society runs our own uh, social events up there and our own members evening. So if you're ever down in the South Highland in the winter or, you know, or even in the summer and we're not in lockdown, then um, you know, do feel free to come in and say hello. Uh, we meet every third Tuesday of the month at the University of Canterbury. And uh, that's a public, uh, it is an open, open to the public night. So please come along. And um, the third Saturday of every month is a uh, social night at the observatory when we can get up there out of you know, when we're not in level two. So uh, love to see anybody if you're on the South Island and want to come down. And even if you, if it's not a club night, just give me a shout. If you're, um, you know, you can find me on Facebook. Um, if you um, sh shout me on um, Astronomy in New Zealand. And um, if you're in town, I'm more than happy to show you around. All righty, so we'll dig into the the world of uh, uh, radio astronomy and um, you'll notice the tagline here is adventures in astronomy for rainy days because radio doesn't care about cloudy skies or whether it's daylight uh, radio waves enter our atmosphere uh, 24 hours a day 365 days a year and um, doesn't really care whether it's uh, low cloud and fog or whether it's br uh, bright sunshine outside which is really really good because uh, as we know, as astronomers, we do get plagued a lot uh, by, uh, by cloud and rainy days, particularly in, in New Zealand. So um, let's jump into this then. So I love to start off every lecture I do. I like to start off with a quote. And the quote uh, this time round is by a guy called Bill Murray, a very famous comedian who says, whatever you do, always give 100% unless you're donating blood. <laughs> So, <laughs> I think I could. Uh, I think I could. Lie. I could. Uh, I could sympathise with that one. <laughs> anyway, so what? So we're gonna, what are we going to look at tonight? So uh, we're going to look at what radio astronomy is. Uh, we're going to look at a little bit of brief history around it. Um, what is in our universe around us? What radio sources do we have? You know, how did we come across all this stuff? When did we discover it? Um, our star is the sun is a huge radio source and um if you've ever listened to a radio receiver during a uh, a solar flare uh, you'll have heard huge waves of noise coming off the sun uh, and it's um it's definitely a very very bright radio source uh, in um, in our uh, backyard so that's one to have a look at and we'll have a look at that um our hey, own Father simon are you are you sharing your screen there oh yes yeah, I am. Hold on. Let me, yeah, let me see what's going on here. I'll reshare it. Let's... Perfect. I can see it now. I don't know what yeah. was going on there. Huh. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we're going to have a look at radio astronomy around Asta. We're going to look at um, the noise sources that come off that, the kind of gear that you would need to look at it. We're also going to look at our own planet because our planet itself is a noisy source of um, radio waves. And um, particularly, um, you know, we are surrounded by thunderstorms. We have a, a very active magnetosphere and um, very active ionosphere. And so um, these are really, really big noise sources for us. So we're going to have a look at that. And then moving further out into uh, our solar system, we're going to look at some of the other big noise sources uh, that are close to home. So uh, things like uh, Jupiter, for example, as a massive radio source that you can detect on the ground here in, on, the, on our planet. And then we're going to look at what you would need to uh, do some deep sky observing, but on a budget. I'm, I'm, you know, you don't need to have a NASA sized budget to do radio astronomy. And I'm going to show you some building blocks and some basic equipment uh, that will allow you to do uh, some deep sky reception. And then we're going to couple, look at a couple of other little simple radio astronomy experiments that you can move on from using the components that you use in these other uh, experiments uh, into um, some other uh, some other areas as well, so that you can um, expand your repertoire of experiments without expanding your um, your wallet. And uh, we'll look at what kind of things to how you can get started. And um, 
I've got some uh, some links here and resources, and uh, just ignore the last uh, reference unless you actually want to sign up <laughs> to be <laughs> a gas member. Uh, we do have some special interest groups around radio astronomy, and so um, there's a lot of information on there as well. So what is radio astronomy then? Well, I mean, uh, when we look at the night sky and we are looking at light from stars, we are actually looking at electromagnetic radiation, but electromagnetic radiation of a certain frequency. Uh, as you come down in frequency, uh, you know, you will move more through, um, you know, uh, the co different colors of the spectrum through to, you know, uh, infrared and, and then through down into the top end of the microwave spectrum and um, then into you know into vhf and shortwave etc and then all the way down through that into the region of uh, very low frequency and low frequency waves um you know down at um you know your uh, am uh, radio uh, frequencies so it's really a you know radio astronomy is just a subfield of, of astronomy that studies celestial objects at radio frequencies and i'm sure you will have seen lovely pictures of uh of the Milky Way done in, you know, X-rays or at, um, at at UHF, and you can see all of the different radio sources. And there's a ton of these, you know, with some big ones like Centaurus A, and uh, you know, Cassiopeia. They're all very, very bright at uh, at RF frequencies. Um, you know, the, the the first detection of radio waves, you know, was done in you know, around 1933. I mean. Um, you know, the pre-war area was a it was a big leap forward in technology. You know, they were starting to venture into the VHF space, um, starting to build receivers that were capable of starting to hear some of this stuff. And Carl Jansky of, of Bell Labs um, first detected, uh, you know, radiation coming from the Milky Way in 1933. Wasn't sure what, really what it was and couldn't really pinpoint what he was receiving. But, um, you know, uh, the name... Uh, Jansky, you know, has um, is synonymous radio astronomy. It's the it's flux measurement at RF, and um, that uh, that you know is, is measured in Janskys. So um, he was a very famous guy. So um, over the years and the decades that passed, you know, uh, both uh, pre-war and post-war um, observations identified uh, quite a lot of different radio emissions around uh, around our solar system and out into um, deep space and um, they detected you know uh, other galaxies etc that were actually ra big radio sources and then um, you know as, uh, as technology moved on and we got lower noise receivers and better amplifiers and you know electronics started to miniaturize um, you know, we reached out for the detecting quasars and pulsars. And, um, you know, also we were able to detect our own sun. And it was um, even around during the war years um, that they realized that our sun was a very large source of radio emissions. Um, even with the basic, um, you know, in the, um, in the UK, uh, with the chain home, uh, which was the basic, um, you know, five meter band radar and 28 megahertz radar that they were using at the time. Um, they realized that, you know, when the sun was in line with the receiver antennas, that they, they were almost blinded because of the noise in the receivers. And that's when they realized that, um, you know, they could put two and two together. Um, Things really took a leap forward, you know, in the 50s, you know, we're looking at the, you know, discovery of co cosmic microwave background radiation, you know, after the Big Bang, um, you know, as the material dispersed and cooled, there is still evidence of a very low level amount of uh, radiation um, emitting radio waves around our, uh, our universe. And uh, this has been well mapped out now, but it was only really in the sort of um, in the 50s that this sort of theory really came together. And um, yeah, just, just worth reiterating that, you know, radio astronomy isn't just about having a NASA dish and, you know, and, and, and billions of dollars of budget, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, an amateur uh, astronomer can build a very nice radio telescope for a very small amount of money. And um, our own, our own uh, Earth um, generates a huge amount of RF noise um, from natural uh, sources that you um, you can really detect with just a few dollars of equipment. 
And um, some people may have already have the right equipment, but never re ne never looked at it. So um, yeah, so you would be thinking really, you know, as we look into the night sky with our telescopes, that uh, in the gap in between all of our stars and and galaxies is actually you know empty. But we know that um, as we look around our universe particularly at the microwave frequencies. You know, so for example, um, one of the common uh, areas to look at is with the so-called hydrogen line at, uh, at 1.4 gigahertz. And um, you know, it was only really into the 60s when they actually really started to build receivers that were capable of running up that, those frequencies. Um, that, that research really led us to that sort of um, detection of that sort of faint background radiation. And um, yeah, the, the really the, you know, we can detect this today using radio telescopes, of course, but if you were to simply turn on the TV, you know, in the old days where you've got analog TV, not now with digital, <laughs> digital signals, when you turn them on, you don't get anything. But if you've still got an old analog TV set and you plug an antenna into that and you'll see that, you know, um, speckled pattern, you know, uh, behind you, if you turn on a... Um, you know, turn on a shortwave receiver with a, you know, a wire antenna and tune, tune away from any kind of station. Just listen to the background hiss. That hiss you're receiving is, is really the leftovers of the Big Bang. Um, the radiation hiss that you can hear is you know, the remnants of that around our universe. So um, closer to home then, you know, when we talked about the Earth being a huge, you know, radiation source, you know, we, there is a lot of uh, radio signals that are generated within our magnetosphere. And um, we can, um, we can also hear some of this phenomenon. So for example, lightning is a very, you know, that, you know, everybody's, um, you know, as a kid, you know, tune the radio off, off channel, knowing there's thunderstorms around, you can hear that big crack as a, as a, as a lightning, you know, in distant storms is received in the, um, in the receiver. And that is, um, that, that is basically a radio emission that you're hearing in that, in that static. There's an energy discharge um, uh, during that lightning emission. And, um, you know, if you're close enough, you can actually see that, you know, because lightning, um, a, it, uh, you can see it, you know, you can see the flash, you can hear it. The thunder is the energy heating up the air around the lightning bolt as it, as it leaves the cloud and, you know, or, or cloud to ground, etc. cetera, um, heats up the air around it, which expands and then contracts. And that's the, the, you know, the energy dissipation um, of that spark, but also on a radio receiver, you can, you can hear uh, that. There are some other hidden effects as well. So one of the things that a lightning discharge uh, creates around it is is um, is high energy, you know, um, plasma, highly ionized um, electrons around it, and um, you can pick that up on the receiver. But also um, it has some strange effects on radio. Um, I was um, operating in Europe on on the microwave bands over there, and uh, we knew and could see some storms, some hundreds of kilometers away. And um, in the path between us and and the UK, and uh, we were actually listening to a radio beacon in the microwave spectrum in uh, in the UK, actually on 23, 23 centimeters, one point two gigahertz. And every time there was a huge flash of lightning, there was a huge enhancement of the signal from the beacon. And we think what was happening is basically the the air around the lightning was you know that that sort of plasma discharge was creating some kind of enhancement um, and we wrote a little paper on it for one of the um, uh, for the microwave groups in the UK and it has very very rarely been observed so it was quite unusual but a, a completely you know alien phenomenon to to us and of course the other the other thing that we see is aurora you know so aurora in our atmosphere um, you know is is basically you know the huge dynamo effect of our magnetosphere um, you know, the in intense um, uh, energy that is being discharged into uh, the upper atmosphere, uh, basically, you know, um, ionizing those gases and, and, and letting you see them. And um, as just showing you the amount of energy that is actually flowing around us. And um, there's also been, you know, uh, Aurora also is a very, very good reflector of radio signals. 
Um, certainly uh, not so much here because of the geometry between us and Australia, but certainly in Europe, they work many thousand kilometers uh, by bouncing signals on VHF and microwaves at the auroral curtain and actually reflecting them back. So there's this, the ionization is, is intense enough to actually reflect signals. And um, when, uh, you know, when you look at those lightning storms and auroras, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on is that we, we can actually detect this using radios. And so, um, you know, it's a specialized area and it's not something that you're going to, um, you know, tune your, um, you know, VHF set in the car to receive, but it doesn't take a huge amount of equipment to do. So um, we were just talking about the cosmic microwave background radiation. So, um, you know, our, um, this is a map that was created back in the 70s using the first all sky surveys. And um, it shows the basically the intensity of, of the cosmic microwave background radiation left over from the Big Bang. And, and what you're seeing there is the blue and red shift as a material, in, you know, is, um, is coming towards us or actually going away. And um, we can measure that Doppler shift. I can actually show you uh, when we come to the deep sky radio telescope, we can actually measure the Doppler shift of our own Milky Way as it drifts through the receivers um, over, uh, over a 24 hour period. So as you zoom further and further away, away from a single galaxy like ours, out into uh, a much wider view, um, you can see that there is a huge amount of, of, uh, of radio emissions left behind from the Big Bang, but also the fact that it is moving, you know, it is actually traveling and not static. There are some areas coming towards us and other areas moving away. So we'll have a look at that too. So looking at our sun then, so, you know, the sun is one of the most sort of interesting radio sources for us in the sky. You know, it is um, something that um, universities and, and solar observatories for NASA and many other of the world's uh, space agencies monitor. Um, they monitor up at the microwave frequencies and, and look at the emissions coming from the sun. But you, um, you know, you, you receive this daily you're actually receiving that energy from the sun, but at a different frequency when you step outside and you feel nice and warm because that's infrared radiation you're receiving from the sun, which is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's just higher. You can't see it, but you can actually, uh, you can actually feel it. Um, so lower down then in the spectrum, uh, you can uh, receive those by using a, um, a VHF receiver. And what you can see at the bottom here is a very, very simple, very low cost uh, radio telescope for solar observing. And um, what, uh, what you can see here is basically a, um, it looks like a car radio because that's what it is. And um, you can see it's actually tuned um, below the bottom of the FM radio band. Um, to an empty channel and the um, audio output is fed into a, a really old um, laptop. Looks like it's seen better days as well. It looks like it's glued together with sellotape. So uh, we probably all got laptops like that lying around or could access one. And it's using a piece of software called Radio Skypipe, uh, which is basically an audio chart recorder. And that's what you're seeing on the right hand side here. Um, you're basically seeing a graph of, um, of intensity of the audio signal. And um, on the bottom, you can see time. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side there of that graph, you know, you can see little peaks and troughs and the sun looks fairly quiet, but then there is a um, bit of a solar flare. And on the right-hand side, you can see that big peak in noise over um, quite some minutes. And that's fairly uh, typical of, uh, of a solar flare. So that's a VHF. The antenna they're using is just that little um, <laughs> little broomstick with some aluminium elements and um, a bit of um, a bit of coaxial cable. That's probably something that would, um, for most of us, we can um, you know buy the bits from Bunnings for a few dollars. Um, finding an old car radio isn't isn't much of an issue these days. Um, people have got them, you know, secondhand car sales and junkyard sales and all sorts of garage sales. It's a really old, you know, pre-digital type. And so, um, you know, using that simple interface, the radio sky pipe is free, you know, using a few dollars for a radio, a junk old laptop, a bit of free software to download. Uh, 
you've got your first radio telescope. And um, the interesting thing is that you can correlate this on different frequencies. If you had a, uh, a shortwave receiver and it doesn't have to be a, you know, flash, um, you know, amateur radio receiver or, um, you know, one that can do single sideband, even a, even a, um, you know, a bit of a traveler's radio with an, an AM, uh, as long as it can mode, as long as you can receive shortwave, then you'll be able to hear the noise increase and you'll be able to correlate those as well. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, sun, you know, when, um, when we are on the receiving end of one of these earth pointing solar flares, then um, we can um, be impacted by them uh, when they impact our atmosphere, we see auroras. And um, there is another little experiment you could do by is building a magnetometer. And um, actually um, uh, the easiest way is to actually find a bar magnet and um, point, uh, you know, drop this um, on a cotton thread um, so that it's balanced and balance it in a jar of oil, which acts as a dampener. And um, when we are impacted uh, by um, a coronal mass ejection and it impacts our, um, uh, our atmosphere, the magnetosphere is pushed back and actually uh, will change the magnetic field around us. And you will see that in the bar magnet by moving. And there are lots of um, you know, higher spec versions of that um you'll find designs for flux gate magnetometers online which will drive uh, computers and um and graphing etc and um you know you can correlate what you see here to some you know days later of actually seeing a um you know an impact on the ground so that's really simple i mean you know that's uh, you can't get much cheaper than than, than that little experiment and uh, you could build this in your garden all you need to do is find a you know a couple of old surplus items, nothing special needed there, and you can build yourself a little solar telescope. So, moving on to Earth observations, then. So, um, our planet is very noisy in in the RF spectrum, and um, you know man is part of that problem. We generate a huge amount of noise ourselves. You know everything from the electronic items that we use on a daily basis, our telecommunications, our travel, et cetera, um, they all add to our planet's uh, RF noise signature. But um, the planet itself has a number of phenomenon that generate noise. We've talked about lightning, for example, as, as one of those. And, um, you know, as, you, as we said, if you tune off station, uh, on a radio receiver, on shortwave, or on, um, on on VHF, you'll hear those static crashes. And that's one form of natural radio signal that you will see. And those, um, you know, if you listen to those, uh, you know, um, you can hear them right down into the VLF spectrum, right down into the, you know, sort of 10s and 20 kilohertz range. And um, the amazing thing is, is how far these radio signals that lightning generates can be received and they're commonly called spherics like atmospherics and um, like many radio transmissions they will you know follow the ground or bounce off the ionosphere or, and, and loop around and you can receive these you know over great distances many thousands of kilometers so i'm going to play you a little um audio clip here and so if you turn up your um Turn up your audio and um, have a, or find us a little set of headphones or something if you've got them on the desk there. Have a listen to this. This is VLF reception of, of lightning over many thousands of kilometers. So if you're anybody that listens to radio around the uh, uh, South Island or in, uh, around the Alps, when um, you get a nor'wester in and there is a ton of storms on the West Coast and Westport and Greymouth are getting absolutely hammered, uh, then you'll be, uh, you'll be very used to that sound. Um, as, we, um, as we get further away from the sources of lightning, we start to see some unusual effects. Some of the higher frequencies uh, travel faster than the lower ones. 
And so we get a little time lag in the signal being received. There's a little shift um, between high and low frequencies. And this causes a slight ringing. And um, these events are called tweaks. And they have a slightly different sound to the crackling and snapping sound that you heard on the other lightning. So this is a, this is a tweak. Yeah, it doesn't sound like the sound is coming through, Simon. So, uh, okay. Uh, two seconds. That's interesting. Okay, just let me just let me stop sharing a second, and then I'll reshare. Sorry, I have a few technical difficulties as well. We tried this earlier on as well. Okay. So let's look at the spherics again. I'll just make sure you can hear this. All good. Ah, great. So that's that popping and crackling sound is basically the lightning over long distances. And as, as I said, if you've lived down here in Christchurch or anywhere in the South Island and, um, you know, the West Coast is getting hammered by a uh, nor'wester, um, you'll be very used to this on a radio that is tuned off frequency because of due to the um, storms that are raging on the other side of the Alps. So as I said there, you know, as we get further away, um, some of the radio signals arrive, uh, you know, um, faster than the other ones and you get this ringing sound um, called tweaks. So this sounds slightly different. Let's play this. Uh... Sounds like somebody hammering on a number eight wire. So there, that's a, that's a, that's a tweak. So um, there is some some other um, some other VLF emissions as well. The, the VLF band is a real interesting one to listen to. Um, you don't need a huge amount of antennas to hear some of this stuff, but um, this this one is called a whistler, and these are um, these are basically um, signals from from lightning that are even more delayed than the tweaks. And what's happening here is that given the delay of them they must actually loop out into space along the field lines of our magnetosphere before snapping back to earth you know uh, on the other side of the planet and um certainly these have been used to study basically the link between uh you know natural radio sources and space you know space physics so this is um these are whistlers <laughs> I'll play that again. It's quite a short clip, but um, how about you, you should be able to hear the sort of, you know, woo. So that sounds like something flying by at high speed. So that's, you know, that um, you, you can imagine the uh, distances that must be traveling to travel that kind of Doppler shift. And uh, finally, Lua, we're looking at Earth observations. And so there is a, um, another natural radio emission uh, at VLF, and this is called Chorus. And um, unlike whistlers, these uh, emissions are generated by high energy electrons um, during solar storms and geomagnetic storms. Um, you know, so alongside visual auroras, we can also receive um, these radio emissions as well. So these sound very, very different again. Earth Chorus. <laughs> it sounds like a jungle full of monkeys to me, but yeah, it's, a, it's very strange. And they're all natural radio emissions. So that's very, very weird. So that's uh, basically, you know, um, what, what you're listening for. So what about the equipment to look at those? So, uh, okay. So um, this is, uh, this is a little um, receiver kit that um, is available easily uh, by, it's part of a NASA project actually. 
Um, NASA run a number of space physics uh, experiments where they have invested heavily into making accessible equipment uh, for schools and, um, and education facilities. And this is um, a little VLF receiver. They are on version three. It's called in, uh, part of the Inspire project. It's the VLF three. And basically it looks for a little um, uh, wire antenna, maybe eight to 10 feet long. Uh, it contains a preamp and you can connect that to a pair of headphones or you can connect it to a computer and use things like radio sky pipe to, uh, to map those. Um, one of the things that um, you can also do is you can feed this audio into uh, some software, um, which will actually give you a spectrum display of the frequency and also the intensity of the and frequency of the audio. You can get very, very nice spectrogram images of, uh, of the sound that you're seeing and the patterns that it actually, it actually creates. You can actually see the differences in intensities and audio and, and the different frequencies involved. And that's quite, um, that's quite enlightening as well, rather than just listening to it on a set of um, headphones. And so, um, yeah, my, some of these kits, you know, yeah, we used to, you know, in the early days of VLF, we used to just put an antenna, you know, 100 meters down the paddock and um you know solder a um solder a plug to it and plug it into an, a, a sound card but these days with computers having built-in sound cards it's not quite as easy these days so um one of these little receivers is quite it's quite handy now um vlf uh, also is the home of some um some very uh, long range um navigation aids like loran etc and Alpha and um, Amiga, these are all sort of radio uh, um, uh, navigation aids that can um, be pretty strong. There's also submarine broadcast transmitters down there as well for nuclear submarines. And um, even things like uh, in Europe, for example, there are services that use um, LF and VLF um, for um, uh, timers. So, for example, turning on streetlights or um, sending uh, timing signals to, um, to cars, things like this. There is a tracking system in the UK and Europe that actually sends um, uh, VLF and LF signals to a receiver that activates a tracker in the car. And that's how they actually turn the trackers on. So um, there is a filter in this as well that can actually um, cut some of this stuff out as well. So um, yeah, the VLF spectrum is a really interesting place to have a listen. This kit's about, I think it was about $130 the last time I, uh, last time I had a look at it. I've got the link to this at the end. So if you want to have a look at it, you can do. All right then. So moving further out into our uh, uh, <clears throat> solar system, um, there is a lot of radio emissions other than the sun and our own planet. And, um, you know, our, our, um, our own planet is very similar to others within our solar system. You know, we have observed, you know, auroras on other planets. We, and we have detected radio emissions from other planets as well, particularly the gas giants. So, um, you know, Uranus, you know, Saturn and Jupiter are all uh, quite bright radio sources, particularly Jupiter. Uh, which is an absolutely massive effect, it has a, a, a very, very strong uh, magnetosphere, but also um, there is a huge dynamo effect going on with planets like Io, um, where these generate some really crazy amounts of, uh, of um, energy. So um, in, in the 50s, they first detected this from Jupiter, and then they really confirmed this in the 70s with the first spacecraft that actually flew by with receivers and confirm that indeed Jupiter is a massive radio source. Um, there are a couple of, um, couple of uh, radio signals or uh, sources being emitted from Jupiter. One is obviously thermal radiation caused by the, you know, the heat in the atmosphere of Jupiter. We're not so worried about that, but on the ground here in, in the Earth, um, you can pick up uh, radio bursts uh, with wavelengths in, in the tens of meters. Uh, so um, just above the uh, 15 meter uh, amateur band uh, at 22.5 megahertz, uh, that is a um, quite a, um, a bright spot for um, for Jupiter emissions. But also up in the cent centimeter band uh, at four gigahertz, there is um, uh, quite a lot of noise from um, from Jupiter up there, and that's caused by uh, basically um, cyclotron radiation. That's electrons being accelerated. Uh, around Jupiter's magnetic field, but like a microwave oven, really. 
And um, it doesn't take a huge amount of uh, equipment to receive uh, Jupiter signals. If you've got a simple um, you know, shortwave radio receiver and uh, a dipole antenna, uh, a dipole is basically uh, two, uh, two uh, lengths of wire. One side of the wire is connected to the center of the coax. The other wire is connected to the, uh, the shield, the ground. And basically you can string this up. It doesn't need to be high. In fact, it's better if it's low to the ground because um, with the um, antenna being low to ground, it tends to look uh, more up than, than horizontally, which is what you want. And if you tune to a clear frequency around 22.5 megahertz, you'll, you'll hear a couple of different types of signals from Jupiter. One is um, over a few seconds, and you'll, you, I'm going to play you some clips of that. These are called L-bursts, and they last several seconds, and they're like big waves of noise. You'd be forgiven for thinking this was, uh, was interference, but it's actually, actually not. And then, um, again, S-bursts, which are... Um, um, bursts that last hundreds of a second and they come in a chain and you would also think this was some kind of electrical interference when you listen to it but again they're both from uh, from Jupiter and um, the way that they uh, they match these was basically um, they could match when we could see Jupiter and the fact that we could receive these and then they started to correlate reception of these to uh, the visibility of Jupiter so here we go. The first one you're going to hear is an L burst, and that's the longer length one. And then I'll directly play the um, S burst, which is the short bursts. So that was the old burst. You'd be, um, you'd be forgiven for thinking that was just some random noise in the receiver, but it was actually, uh, it's actually Jupiter. So here's the S burst, which is a very different sound. So S burst. So there's two different types, but again, you know, if you were just tuned off frequency or um, wandered across those at the top end of the shortwave band, you wouldn't even recognize them. And it was only for many, many years as being a ham radio operator, I, you know, um, started to. Um, I, I saw an article on them, and um, I had to listen and realize what I'd been listening to all these years, and then I could identify them. Okay, so that's uh, Jupiter. Now, what about the equipment to um, receive that. So um, for Jupiter reception, then any shortwave receiver that is capable of receiving 22.5 megahertz can be used as a, as a Jovian radio receiver. And um, these days, people are starting to use uh, what are called software-defined radios. Now, in a traditional radio, you're using um, electronic components, inductors, capacitors, and um, you know, building tuned circuits that respond. You know, they build a local oscillator and a detector. And um, these days now, you can get these in a, what's called a software-defined radio, which is basically a radio on a, um, on a processor um, in a USB stick. And these are really, really cheap. They're like thirty dollars, and um, they are more than capable of uh, of being connected to a, a, a dipole antenna and receiving Jupiter, along with even the VLF stuff that we can hear here. Um, there are also some dedicated um, uh, receiver kits as well. Uh, Radio Jove is another um, uh, NASA project receiver, and um, the um, the antennas for these, you know, you can build a simple antenna with just you know some some um, some wire from Bunnings and a you know uh, what we call in the UK a chocolate block connector, you know, which is a plastic block with the um, with the screws in, and you shove the wires on each side. So. 
Um, NASA's got a great resource page for uh, for Jovian radio reception. It's called Ra the Radio Jove page, and I've included the link here. And uh, I'll send James the uh, a copy of the presentation. You can share this uh, within the society as uh, as a resource page. You can also find it if you just look for Radio Jove from NASA. All righty. So what about deep sky stuff then? So, you know, this is great. We've listened to the Earth. We've listened to the planets. You know, what about, you know, further out into space? Now, um, while amateur reception of pulsars is not impossible and has been done, um, most of the energy radiated from a pulsar is fairly weak. Um, and um, also um, a lot of it lies at the top end of the UHF spectrum. Now, uh, the challenge with that is uh, A, the wavelength, and that means uh, any kind of dish, um, you know, parabolic dish antenna that will give you enough gain is going to be sizable, probably more sizable than, you know, 99.9% um, .9 of us can manage in our gardens, particularly if you live in the city. So, um, you know, uh, looking, at, um, looking at something like a pulsar, uh, while it could be a society project or, um, you know, if somebody has some space and some you know, big enough land to put a big enough dish on, um, the, we don't really need that. Um, actually, one of the best things to, uh, to observe deep space stuff is at, uh, at hydrogen line, uh, which is at 420 megahertz. And um, you can use a very, very small satellite TV style dish. You can use the uh, software defined radio receiver um, coupled with a very, very cheap uh, pre-amplifier um, to do uh, hydrogen line reception. So um, hydrogen line is basically, you know, um, uh, hydrogen atoms basically radiating uh, RF uh, energy um, at, um, at 420 megahertz. Now, um, obviously, you know, areas of our night sky don't have... Um, uh, you know, large amounts of hydrogen, but we know our Milky Way, for example, if, you know, if you look at James's, um, James's background image of the Milky Way, uh, in, that, um, in the, some of those bright areas of that core um, is, um, is really, really, um, you know, is really emitting um, a lot of radiation. You know, um, Cassiopeia, for example, you know, is, um, is a well-known uh, emitter of, um, of uh, RF energy. And so you can uh, detect um, radio sources like Cygnus and, and CAS and, and the arms of our Milky Way by detecting the amount of noise that is basically generated at 1420 megahertz as it drifts through the uh, um, uh, antenna of your receiver. So, um, you need to be imaging, you know, and receiving this over long periods of time and basically taking little snapshots all the time. Um, so it requires a computer and um, you can certainly um, build a little um, deep sky receiver using simple, some simple equipment. So um, what can you do with this? Of course, you know, if you point it around the sky, you're going to see peaks of noise, you know, over long periods of time. Um, unlikely, unless you're pointing at the sun, that you will receive really, really big peaks in the noise. And, and of course, a hydrogen line receiver can also be used at, um, you know, to, to point at the sun. Um, but you could do other things. You can measure the, the size and shape of our galaxy, for example, is, you know, the thicker areas of the Milky Way will have much more hydrogen and lots, uh, a lot more noise that you can see. And, um, you know, you will see bigger spikes on your receivers uh, uh, there. Also, you can measure the rotational speed of the galaxy and, and measure things like the, the Doppler shift as the um, part, different parts of our Milky Way rotate through your antenna. And I will show you this on, a, on an image in a second. Um, so doing this, you do basically what's called a drift scan. Uh, you don't need to point the dish around. You can park it somewhere where you know that the Milky Way is going to uh, drift through the visibility of your dish and um, basically leave this running over a day. And as the Milky Way drifts through your receiver, you will see the, the rise and um, dips of the Milky Way as it passes through, and you can map those on your receiver. So this is what I was talking about. So this uh, little silver box is a uh, is a USB receiver, and um, the dish antenna is um, is something you can pick up off Amazon for a few bucks. It's it's actually 
called a you know a, a barbecue dish <laughs> it actually looks like something off a rack off a barbecue and really basic what it is is um it is actually um the radio signals are coming in and they're being focused on that little block at the top there it's you know, just the um the connected to the actual receiver cable receivers down underneath uh, and then that is a usb cable down into the receiver um basically the computer down in the uh, room somewhere and this is just pointing at the sky and all you're, what you're looking for is the actual milky way to actually drift through the view of that dish at um at some time of the day on the right here you can see on the right you can see there's a graph in the blue which is actually the noise at 14 20 megahertz that's the RF spectrum that the receiver is receiving and you'll see there's like lots of little spikes in there and that's just interference from Wi-Fi and radio signals around us um, we actually call this grass if you've um, actually been involved with radar and, uh, and radio this is on a, a spectrum display it's called grass it's just random bits of noise um, random interference um, that the receiver is picking up and on the left hand side is Stellarium there's a view of the Milky Way here and um, you'll see as we um, as we run the video, um, you will see the Milky Way rotate and just watch the noise on the right hand side here where that big spike is just look to the left of that and, and we'll run the sequence now. So the Milky Way is rotating, it starts to rotate through the dish, Wump, 14, 20 megahertz, a big wallop in the signal and look at the Doppler shift, it's actually moving in frequency. So that means what you're seeing is actually changing its orientation. It's either coming away, um, probably actually moving away from us. At, um, normally, um, the signal is, uh, if I recall, is um, higher in frequency as it's coming towards you because the, um, the, the waves are getting bunched up uh, as they come towards us. And then as they move away, the, the waves are actually getting dragged out slightly. Um, which means that you know, the Doppler is, uh, is dropping. So I'll just run it again. And if you look here, here at, uh, you can see this big peak and then you'll start to see the Doppler take, uh, take effect. And there she goes. That's pretty clever, huh? For a simple piece of, uh, simple piece of electronics and a computer. And um, you could take this one step further um, and by doing these, um, uh, drift scans with bigger dishes. If you make a dish with a couple of meters and you know, there's a lot of satellite TV equipment hanging around old buildings, um, you know, old C-band equipment or, um, you know, uh, equipment that is designed for Asian TV uh, reception. Um, they're usually two or three meters, 2.7 meter dishes. You can find them on Trade Me. Um, you could start to point this at you know, some areas of the sky and actually start to look at um, mapping out radio sources so this is cygnus a and um what the guy has done is let it drift through and done you know a whole bunch of drift scans um just changing the orientation of the dish slightly on each day and he's mapped out what you can see on the side here in um in excel and mapped the values into different colors and you can actually start to see um what the you know cygnus a um, cloud looks like at, uh, at, at the hydrogen line. You actually start to map out what it looks like. Not particularly good resolution because you know we're um, you know doing a drift scan and um, not seeing um, you know huge sample rates. We're not a we're not a NASA scope, but it looks pretty good to me. So that's hydrogen line. So what about other things then? So what else can we turn our little uh, de software defined receiver uh, into? Well, um, meteors, for example, while meteors themselves don't emit radio waves, they do leave behind a very highly ionized trail and um, <coughs> that can reflect radio signals. Um, most of the materials is the electrons that are stripped from atmospheric oxygen due to the heat around the meteor as it um, enters. And um, most of the meteors are burning up around 95 to 130, 140 kilometers up. And so, uh, you know, the geometric range between, you know, what I can see here in New Zealand, um, you know, at, at that height is, you know, a couple of thousand kilometers, which um, will land us almost into, um, you know, Eastern seaboard of, uh, of Australia. And, um, 
you don't need to be transmitting uh, a, um, a signal. You can be listening to an example to a beacon, and there's plenty of amateur radio beacons around uh, that you're more than capable of using a, a software-defined radio receiver. Uh, or um, you could listen to a broadcast station, you know, like an FM station. Um, sadly, these days, the, um, the old analog TV stations have gone, uh, but they used to be uh, very, very good sources of meteor scatter signals. And I remember as a, as a, um, a 14 year old boy with a brand new radio license in the UK, listening to uh, 49 megahertz and listening to the um, very high power uh, TV transmitters from Eastern Europe and hearing the pings uh, just at the bottom end of, uh, of the six meter band on, uh, on my receiver uh, due, to, uh, due to meteors. But um, you can use that same SDR and um, you can see here, there's a little three, um, three element VHF uh, Yagi. Yagi is just a nice name for an, a, a directional antenna. And um, this is made up of just some, um, some aluminium parts and um, pretty easy to, uh, to make uh, with some, um, some little bit of plastic tubing for insulators. And uh, you can feed that into that software defined radio, um, find a broadcast station. So for example, say on the North Island, something that you wouldn't hear on a daily basis. And um, you can listen for the meteors as they, uh, as they ping through the atmosphere, burn up, leave that trail and bounce the, uh, bounce the signal um, to you here in, um, you know, so you could do it either way. You could be listening to a broadcast station in um, uh, Australia, or you might um, tune to something local here in the Christchurch area and hear it uh, from Auckland. That's only 900 kilometers. And I can certainly tell you there's a huge amount of uh, material, you know, even grains of sand. It doesn't have to be huge rocks little grains of sand, but it's a space debris. So uh, um, Josh's um, 1500, um, you know, uh, bits of junk eventually will burn up uh, and provide you with some reflectivity. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, you can use these to track random meteors. There's stuff entering our atmosphere all the time, or you can use it to track meteor showers and you can actually track the numbers of pings. And, um, you can use a bit of software to start counting them. You don't have to start you know, you know, watching, uh, watching those uh, ping rates. Uh, you can um, look at those zenith hourly rates on a, on a computer and start to map them. So um, what are the sound like then? So uh, again, you've got a bit of a, a sound clip here. So this is a, uh, a meteor scatter ping. It's actually from America, um, from a VHF receiver that is actually listening to a TV broadcast transmitter. I'll just play that again, it's a pretty short clip. Quite a wobbly signal, you know, because the A, the um, the trail isn't isn't uniformly ionized. The the you know the rock is um, potentially spinning, burns up and you know um, ionizes different parts of the trail. And depending on how long the trail is, that part different parts of the trail will be received at your station um, earlier or later. Um, than others, depending on the orientation of the actual track of the a meteor to you. So that's quite good. And I've used this extensively. I was talking to James earlier on about this. Um, I actually use this to actually make some amateur radio contacts across the ditch from, from Canterbury all the way into Tasmania. So um, this, is, um, this is a recording that I did. Um, this is me working a guy called um, Rex, who's very well known, VK7MO, he's in Tasmania, and um, I've got a couple of Yagi antennas set up here in Christchurch, and what's happening is that we're transmitting, 30 seconds I'm transmitting to him, 30 seconds he's transmitting to me, and using a very, very accurate timing, um, we're sending different messages to each other using digital modes, uh, at very high speed. So we don't need much of a signal off a meteor to actually um, pick up enough information to make a contact. That's the two Yagis, and this is what the signal looks like on a spectrogram. You can see it was some seconds long.
And you can see there, actually, if I go back a little bit, you might be able to see there's the message. So VK7 MO ZL4 PLM 73s, which is kind regards, best wishes. Uh, and that was the end of our um, that was the end of our contact. So um, what else can you do with your little box then? So you've invested, uh, you know, $30 and um, bought a preamp and you've got this thing, you know, sitting on the desk. What else can you do after you've done all these experiments? Well, um, one of the other things you can do is um, there's a number of satellites around the moon um, that some of the lunar rover um, orbiters have basically um, had uh, beacons on them. And you could use your little satellite dish to have a look for those. And um, uh, down at the uh, bottom end of the 23 centimeter band, which is the amateur radio band at 1.2 gigahertz, um, there is a beacon uh, from uh, Belgium. Um, and the call sign is um, ON0EME. EME stands for Earth, Moon, Earth. And um, of course, is, uh, is talking about the signal bouncing from the Earth back to the Moon and to the ground. And uh, this transmits on a, um, a very um, you know, specific frequency. It's uh, locked to GPS, so it's very accurate. And it's also a very well calibrated transmitter signal. And um, so what can you do with this signal if you hear it? And so you can uh, calculate the lunar distance, for example, if you know how long the, um, the path has taken from the ground to the moon, then um, you can calculate the distance uh, that it's taken for that signal, um, knowing that the, you know, the speed of uh, radio travels. Uh, you can measure the Doppler shift uh, from that signal. So when we start off with the moon in the east, um, the Doppler shift will be high uh, than, the, uh, than the known frequency. As the moon gets to its meridian, it will start to get to zero uh, Doppler shift, i.e. it will be on frequency. And then as it moves down to the southwest, uh, ready to, uh, to set, uh, the Doppler shift will increase again and you will see uh, the, the, um, the, the Doppler dropping. So you can actually measure the orbital velocity as well. And um, you can even tell what kind of surface the signals are you know, bouncing off on the moon. Uh, the moon isn't a flat plate reflector. It's not a, um, it, it's not a mirror. It's made up of mountains and craters and different areas that have different reflectivity. And so you can um, analyze the signal that is coming back. Um, we call it liberation fading, which is basically peaks and troughs because the signals are coming to you off a mountain versus a flat area and they're coming off a, you know, a crater over here and a bit of a flat area over there, you can actually work out what's being reflected. So, um, and um, your little, sorry. Uh, yep. what, what is interesting is that uh, the local Hibiscus Coast um, uh, Amateur Radio Club is actually building another one of these um, uh, EME beacons here. Mm. Um, which hopefully will should be up sometime next year. So doing exactly the same thing as the Belgian one, just the other yeah. the world. So the challenge with that will be that you to receive that you will need to be um, further, fur, you know, far enough away in frequency, but also physically further away from the transmitter uh, that you don't hear it on the ground. Um, but then um, if you can barely hear it on the ground, but you've got to receive also uh, a moon bounced signal, you can measure the difference between the two. Uh, and you can actually measure again that, um, that distance between the objects. So these are real simple. So you know, in terms of um, you know, antenna, this is, um, this is a small dish that somebody made uh, in their garden. It's actually a set of um, aluminium uh, tubes. Um, that they bent <laughs> and created a parabolic dish with some chicken wire over the top of that, a bit of bent wire as a um, as a an antenna to feed the receiver, and that's basically feeding one of those SDRs that we talked about earlier uh, via a preamp. Um, it's even got a little um, a satellite TV positioner. Um, I don't. These must be getting really really rare to find on. Um, uh, on the surplus market, um, but um, yeah, uh, this basically is able to move the dish in um, in azimuth uh, over a period of time uh, to keep the dish tracking on the moon. So this is pretty simple stuff, and um, you know nothing we've we've looked at here um, is you know a few uh, more than a few dollars, and you can actually build one of these dishes by actually bending um, bamboo or, or wood strips 
and actually putting a, um, a string from the end of the arm up to a center point um, using a piece of um, you know, fiberglass or wood um, up the middle. And um, you can stress these arms to create a, a parabolic curve. Plenty of designs on the internet for these. Okay, getting to the end then. So how would you get started? Well, the idea should be that you keep things simple. Don't, um, don't spend a fortune. Don't try anything on a NASA sized budget. Use what you've got or what you can find. Um, these little um, RTL SDR receivers, they're basically about 30 US dollars from Amazon. All the software that you've seen here is free to download. Um, those simple receiver kits for VLF are, um, you know, between $100 and $200. Um, most of the antennas for LF and VLF can be made using simple wire. The Yagi's out of simple bits of aluminium tubing. Um, I'm sure um, that you can still buy um, VHF Yagi's on, um, on, you know, on the market. And um, basically you can utilize them. Um, uh, easy to find uh, objects around us to actually receive this stuff. Basically, I would say also, you know, learn how to solder. One of the greatest things that you'll learn to do using this part of the hobby is uh, uh, buy a soldering iron, get some basic tools and learn how to solder. Um, plenty of ability to, uh, to, to learn how to do that. Check out Trade Me, uh, eBay, for example. There's always surplus equipment turning up. Beg, borrow, you know, whatever you can find. And if you can find a friendly radio ham that can loan you a, um, a an HF receiver for a while, borrow one of those. And um, you know, surplus receivers do come up on on Trade Me on a regular basis. Um, check out the resource page at the end for all of the links. But I would say the best thing, the best advice is um, find a subject area that you want to focus on and actually um, you know stay focused on that for a while. Um, learn how to drive it, spend some time observing, um, do some longer term observations, get to know what you're seeing. You know, if you're doing Jupiter, you know, start working out, you know, the visibility of Jupiter, when you can see it, what kind of conditions, you know, where are the moons? Does that affect, you know, the noise, the, the noise that you're receiving? And, um, and then, you know, take baby steps. Um, most of the microwave stuff these days, um, you know, the, the Wi-Fi uh, market has allowed us to find lots and lots of very, very useful things. Um, dishes uh, from the satellite TV market and um, ready-made cables. The pre-amplifiers come in a little block. The USB receivers are all pre-made. So most of the stuff these days you don't need to make to do reception. And you don't need a license. That's the other thing. You don't need a license. So... Um, and I've put uh, a whole bunch of, um, of links in here so you can uh, have a look at this. Um, the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, SARA, a very, very good location for resources. Um, you can have a look at these um, sites for the RTL SDR. And um, there's articles on there about, um, you know, hydrogen line Milky Way reception and also the Cygnus um, star forming region. Of course, we're going to struggle with that, but we have our own radio sources in the Southern Hemisphere as well. But that will give you an idea how this thing works. Uh, International Meteor Organization, for they have a radio section as well, NASA Jove Radio for looking at Jupiter, and Radio Skypipe is a little graphing software. And there's a whole bunch of software that you can find on these sites as well. All righty, that's a quick whistle stop tour of, uh, of how to get involved in radio astronomy. This, um, this presentation was created out of the desire by, uh, by the CAS committee to actually get some of our members more involved in other areas of astronomy, um, such as meteor reception, aurora, you know, and uh, and radio astronomy, and um, they've got a few people who are busying themselves uh, building receivers now. So um, that's pretty much me. Um, I'd take any questions if you're still awake. Yeah. Um... Yeah, quite interesting because I've done quite a lot of those <laughs> things and sitting in the garage, I've got a few bits and pieces. Uh, as you're saying, uh, those little dongles are just so easily available. Um, they are, yeah. You can get them yeah. on Trade Me uh, as well mm. if you don't want to do the Amazon way. Um, and those resources at rtlsdr.com, 
uh, brilliant. Uh, there, there's so many other things that you can do using these dongles. It's, it's, it's absolutely mind blowing. You know, you just just go back ten years, and you know you would never have been able to do that. No. Um, Those little SDRs are great because you can do all sorts. You can do you know um, aeronautical beacon reception, um, HF um, aeronautical radio, listening to um, aircraft coming across the um, the Pacific or across the Tasman. You know, um, shipping, ham radio, of course, you know, you can have a tune round uh, broadcast. Um, you know, there's still a lot of international uh, broadcasting using shortwave. So one of these little things and a little bit of wire will keep you very, very busy for long <laughs> periods of time. Yeah, it gets you a bit hooked. <laughs> can do, but it's good if it's raining or windy or cloudy. It's always good to have something to keep the mind occupied versus yeah. the Netflix. <laughs> It's I always say, uh, with radio astronomy, it doesn't matter if it's overcast. That's it. As I said, adventures in, adventures in astronomy for rainy days. So uh, in terms of uh, your club, uh, what are they doing in terms of radio astronomy at the moment? Oh, we've got a magnetometer running and we've been doing some Jupiter. We have a, a Jove radio receiver. And um, there's a few people uh, building, um, you know, VLF receivers as well. It's a fairly new thing for us. We, what we've tried to do is, um, you know, as the club has expanded, uh, we've tried to consider that other people have other interests versus looking through a telescope eyepiece. So um, we've started to branch out into, um, you know, uh, trying to encourage others uh, to look at different aspects of astronomy and, you um, this was uh, this was an idea, you know, to uh, to present to the society's membership on our um, on a meeting like this and give people some, you know, little sort of um, you know little seeds of information and and, and um, interest that that might spark some uh, some activity. Nice. If anyone else has got questions, uh, you just need to unmute yourself. Um, so that's probably the bottom left-hand side um, of your, of your And I will say I've tried to I've tried to keep this as kind of high level as possible because some areas of this are really complex, but um, it doesn't need to be complex. I think that's what I that you know that's the yeah. point of the presentation is that you don't need to be a an a, you know a NASA size budget or a radio engineer to get involved in this stuff. So fire away if you've got any questions, please do. I was also quite interested in the, um, yeah, what you're mentioning about uh, pulsars, uh, because there's a, a, a lot of uh, interest in that as well in the sort of the ham radio slash radio astronomy mm. group. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, some of the guys who developed the you know, WSJT software in that, um, they've been playing around with uh, detecting pulsars. Uh, using the same sort of yeah know, because computer. using using wsjt so for those that are on the call that you know we're probably talking an an alien word but wsjt is a piece of software uh, combined with a receiver that allows you to receive um signals um well below the hearing threshold and um then map them out on a display so um, yeah, basically you can receive signals over long periods of time that you would not see, and you can see the trace of these on a on a on a display. So I did see a question there on the chat. So uh, Ben says, cool topic. Yeah, it is very cool. Uh, any fun exercises you could run by adding a Raspberry Pi? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. You know, like the um, the uh, spectrogram uh, software and analysis will definitely run on a Pi. Um, there are RAM interfaces um, to drive SDRs uh, using uh, the Pi as a display and um, controller. So yeah, there's lots of ways to um, to tie a Pi into a receiver um, from a reception, but also you know controlling hardware. Well, one of my own little projects uh, that I was been working on is uh, uh, detecting the the waterline, but having the entire thing uh, encased in the feed horn. So yeah. uh, on the end of the thing, so you get your your, your antenna. Um, your RTL and your PAR all 
working together and it just uh, streams the IQ back to mm. uh, back to the office or you know wherever you're working uh, so yeah there's there's plenty of things that the raspberry pies mm. <laughs> can do and, and the other thing is as well is if you start hunting around the internet you will find a few places that actually have live receivers for meteors live receivers for vlf etc and um, you can actually um jump onto these receivers and actually um you know log on tune to these to these frequencies on different side, you know different locations around the planet and have a listen to uh, what they can receive and most of them will carry you know multiple um, users at the same time which is um, also it's not like um, you know I'm tuning this receiver and uh, James cannot um, cannot do anything with it they actually support multiple users at the same time actually one of those SDRs is called Kiwi SDR it was actually developed yeah. here in New Zealand so but uh, he, he actually runs uh, one of those uh, listening mm. stations up uh, Bay of Islands. Yeah. Um, you know, very, very interesting guy there. All righty. Any, uh, any further questions or uh, if comments? You, if, or... if you don't want to or you can't talk, you can do what uh, can... Ben yeah. said. You can put yeah, it in the chat. Type them, type them in the side. So if you if you ever look at the bottom of your screen and you move your mouse around, you'll see a little thing that says chat. Just click on there and you can type up. I don't want to speak too loudly, but it's actually a clear sky outside. You're welcome, Chris. Thank you very, very much. Very uh, pleased to be invited along. I hope it was stimulating. I hope you'll find something of interest. The great thing about this subject is that um, you don't have to have a big telescope. You don't, um, you know, you don't need to have you know thousands of dollars worth of telescope and uh, and cameras to do uh, to to do radio observations. So, could you place a dish on the telescope mount to follow an object? Uh, yeah, you probably could. Um, what I have seen is the bigger mounts. Um, so people, you know, for those that have got um, equipment themselves, um, some of the big mounts like uh, the EQ8, for example. Um, you can certainly mount a, a, a small dish on one of those, um, equatorially mount it and track the Milky Way um, using that for sure. Yeah, I have seen that done. Yep. Thanks, Sandy. I know I'm going to go out and do some narrowband imaging, which is uh, imaging hydro at um, basically hydrogen alpha to try and avoid the moon. So I'm going to be looking as well to the south to try and avoid that searchlight. <laughs> it's guaranteed it's a clear night and it's a full moon. I could yeah. almost, you know, yeah. uh, if I could, you know, I can't win the lottery, but I could almost guarantee that, you know, a clear night will uh, will land on a full moon. You're just lucky I'm not down there because as soon as you start looking south, an aurora, an aurora will pop up. So. Oh, I had that, I had that <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago because it was a really nice night and I was planning to image but it would have been a waste of time because um, the aurora was right overhead. So I'd have been looking through that auroral curtain. So after um, 15 minute images through that, I don't think I'll be seeing much of my uh, my target. So, In terms of your uh, astrophotography, um, what, what, what sort of equipment are you running at the moment? Uh, so at home here, I've got two piers and two mounts. I've got a couple of Ioptron CM60s on one pier. I have an Esprit uh, 120, um, a, a Skywatcher. Um, I have multiple cameras on those. I've got uh, color cameras. I've got um, monochrome cameras with um, LRGB filters and, and, and narrowband filters. Um, they've all got telescope mounted computing. So I've got eagles on them so I can automate the, um, the observatory is also automated. Um, I have um, weather monitoring uh, control on the observatory so I can close the roof if uh, if I lose uh, lose star luck because of uh, fog or cloud and then on the other um, on the other mount I've got an explore um, scientific uh, 127 another refractor and that's also kitted out with um, uh, monochrome and color imaging nice. and um, I've got a couple of other telescopes too many yes. um i've got an, RC, <laughs> I've got an i've got an rc8 which is a little eight inch um richie creation uh, telescope i've got some smaller wide field imaging and um dslrs we all, well mirrorless cameras these days with um camera lenses for for wide field aurora and milky way so 
yeah, most of my time is spent um, is, is spent imaging one way or another. Um, not so much on the radio these days. <laughs> and what sort of telescope has um, the society got down there? So if you look behind me, this is a picture of one of our open nights. So we're looking at the 14-inch uh, dome there. And so we've got a 14-inch um, a RC in that. Um, but further behind that, we've got a couple of domes with 120-millimeter uh, um, uh, Skywatcher refractor, um, an ED1, um, ED120. And we've got a couple of 11-inch telescopes, uh, schmidt cassegrains whole bunch of dobs and um, you know, small portable equipment, camera trackers, uh, CM40 for doing um, astrophotography. And the big one, which is actually the other way, well, actually behind you, um, behind my shoulder on um, this way, is a 16-inch telescope, uh, which is our big uh, Mead uh, RCX400, uh, which is 16-inch one and a roll-off roof as well. So we've got quite a lot of equipment and um, yeah, it gets well used. We're doing a lot of um, scientific stuff now. Uh, Rob um, Glassy, our president, he, um, he's been working on a program of um, um, asteroid um, tracking and um, reporting. So uh, he's, he's doing asteroid work. And we've got quite a few sort of active images as well, plus lots of um, junior stuff as well, doing you know, night sky imaging, dragging dobs out onto the lawns when the weather's nice. So, yeah, we've got some quite good, um, good enthusiastic junior members who will be our future members as well. So that's, that's where we are. You know, we're a very young club. Um, we've just been going a couple of years now, but uh, we've got some really great members. So most of them are here. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we've got a, a couple of uh, very enthusiastic uh, youngsters as well. So, you know, at the yeah. moment, just you know, building up uh, uh, things. Uh, you, usually, you know, after a meeting, you know, Paul who's, uh, um, uh, gets his uh, dog out um, in the car park and uh, has a bit of a tour around, of course, if it's not cloudy, <laughs> that is. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, we have, we have, you know, obviously our UC meeting, which is a more public meeting in the university in a classroom. But, um, yeah, our um, training nights that we do um, twice a month and, um, you know, our, um, our own social meetings allows us to get out. But in the winter when we're running public nights, um, you know, most, uh, most of the volunteers after, um, you know, doing Fridays and maybe Saturdays at the observatory and then they may be doing a Wednesday for a private group. Um, after a couple of months of that, and if there's some really good weather, it gets <laughs> get a bit <Yeah>. tired. <laughs> It's, it's nice. quite amazing. Some really. nights you're desperate for a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Please be cloudy. I really want to sit in front of the TV tonight. No, yeah, we we quite quite lucky. Um, you know, Chris Benton and myself. You know, we, we both um, do the talks locally, but uh, Chris has been doing quite a lot of uh, talks with uh, other groups and societies uh, you know, around about. Uh, couple of the boating uh, people and you know the, the more people hear about us the more they ask us to get involved with uh, things uh, mm. especially now with uh, Matariki coming as a, a yeah. holiday um, so that, you know, it's great that you know the, the more we out there the more people hear about us and you know, people as I say it. we use Facebook a lot and um, we can fill uh, we can fill an open night on a Friday with 90 people if it's clear no problem at all you yeah. know I could do you know 20 nights through the season um, if those 20 nights were clear we'd have no problem filling them um, we have a great, you know, a good support from our local council as well. We work very closely with Selwyn District Council. We have a lighting covenants around the um, uh, around the observatory for five kilometer radius. Nice. So they're controlling light for us. Um, our Selwyn District Mayor is a member, has his own, he has a 12 <laughs> inch always dog. <laughs> always great, you know, what do they say? You know, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we uh, we we co-opted him as a uh, keep the co-opted him as a uh, as an honorary member, and um, we do things like getting involved with local shows. We involved a lot with the Christchurch City Council for um, things like Kids Fest, also the library. Yeah. So um, the library here in. Um, 
in Christchurch has a very active kids program. So we get involved. We did, um, we did a space week, a uh, space week last year where we had a stand for a whole week there, which was, um, which was interesting. And, uh, and then we do our own events as well. You know, if we get um, the NASA, come and visit Christchurch with Sophia, which is the, um, you know, if you know much about Sophia, which is the big flying infrared telescope, um, the crews um, love coming over. They come to our um, barbecues and um, spend time at the observatory, which is great. And of course, they reciprocate. We get, um, you know, nice private tours around <laughs> the aircraft for members. And nice. um, yeah, they, they some some very good friendships built up there. So, and of course, a few years ago, we got an invite onto TVNZ, which was an, an absolutely amazing experience. And that came out of a random conversation. And suddenly we're on primetime news at, you know, nine o'clock and we've got a three minute slot on, you know, um, astronomy at CAS. And we had, a, you know, film crew out there for three hours and an yeah. evening with us. Um, we sold out all our tickets within a day, you know, that kind of, that kind of publicity we just could never buy you know it would be impossible we couldn't afford it no we, we're quite lucky because uh, you know we've got the big uh, radio telescope observatory up in walkworth uh, mm. run by Auckland uni uh, usually every year uh, you know we end up going up there and giving a tour around and uh, you know they show us what they they're up to uh, which is always quite interesting um so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, is there, if there's any more, I keep you guys. Is there any if there's any uh, any, any, last last, any last questions or comments or anything you'd like to know about uh, the Canterbury Astronomical Society? But just uh, again, you know, just reiterate, you know, more than welcome for you guys. If you're passing, please come and say hello and uh, come and visit, and they will be very um, very pleased to host uh, anybody that's coming down. Now we've got a couple of members into astrophotography and they frequently down your neck of the woods. So That's um, great. thanks for the invitation. I'm sure they'll definitely take you up on that. Please do. Simon, thank you very, very much for uh, joining us today. Um, really no, excellent Thank you for the talk. invite. <laughs> and um, yeah, see, we've ended up with a few more people than we started with, which is always good. Um, but thank again, you, John. Thanks, you know, Ian. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the aims that we've had during this lockdown is to try and build up, uh, you know, this rapport between the clubs around South Africa, uh, South Africa around New Zealand, um, and um, you know, we're very, very happy that uh, you've come on uh, as a, a good example of uh, South Island hospitality and uh, what you guys get up to. So, uh, thank you very, very much. Um, for everyone else, uh, don't forget, uh, we're running our little contest uh, with uh, uh, Eclipse tomorrow, Lunar Eclipse. Uh, doesn't matter if you're a beginner, if you don't know anything about photography, if you've just got a cell phone, you know, go for it. You know, you don't have to be up for the entire time. You know, you could maybe 10 o'clock just go out and take a snap of uh, the peak. And if you, if you don't even... Uh, you know, if you don't have a camera that works very well, you can draw a picture, paint a picture. Um, we've even got our resident poet. You know, she, is, she is here. Um, you know, do, a, do a poem. There's many, many, many prizes uh, for, for every, every, everyone who enters. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I think we'll wrap it up here. See you. Hey guys, lovely to meet you all, and I hope to meet you again. I've got a, a, a repertoire of, uh, of interesting uh, uh, presentations, James, so if you ever get stuck again and uh, <laughs> want something, <laughs> and you can stand me, you know, uh, keeping you entertained for an hour or two, then uh, give me another shout. We'd love to, to help you. Yeah, so, you know, being, being in lockdown and trapped in Auckland, it's always nice to see people from beyond the border. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of, um, yeah, we're kind of uh, free, but not really free. It's, uh, we are, we are able to go to work and, um, and do a bit of traveling, et cetera, coming back home and, you know, but going into places and, you know, trying to get entertainment and stuff like that is, you know, 
yeah, we're we're free ish. Yeah, uh, Chris. Well, while I remember, you could stop recording now. Thank you. Yeah, good luck and enjoy the uh, eclipse tomorrow night. And actually, what the, the, is interesting about the poems because we um, one of our last events.